As you see, I will be speaking about the rather not existent yet speculative communities. And uh, I will start with the uh, current situation in Poland, but not only in Poland. Uh, uh, as you may know, um, we got, we, I mean Poles, for our representative <laughs> Olga Tokarczuk. Uh, she has got a Nobel Prize for the year uh, 2018. And um, I will just start with what she said in one of her first interviews after <coughs> receiving the Nobel Prize in Literature. Olga Tokarczuk referred to Poland as an open country where all minorities had always been tolerated. However, she did it in order to definitely contradict the prevalent image. And I quote, just the opposite. We have done terrible things as colonizers, as the ethnic majority suppressing minority, as slave owners of murderers of Jews, unquote. A few days later, an open letter to Olga Tokarczuk, signed by a certain Ivona L. Konieczna, was distributed via social media. It is a very long letter, emotional and repetitive, but quite compelling in the context of my argument. The author writes explicitly, and I quote, Multiculti is a crime against our nation. It is a source of its weakness and potential annihilation, unquote. Such a strong conviction calls also for comparing the current situation with the one from the past. As the author posits, also almost 90% of Poles are against it, Poland has to face a forced implantation of a new ethnic minority, which is, quote unquote, culturally alien, uneducated, unwilling to assimilate for religious re reason, poor. And she, the author of the letter, concludes, and I quote, an analogy with Jews, shtetls, and city districts occurs by default. By the letter, both the letter and the views of its author could be easily left unheeded. Yet, they correspond largely with statements formulated in the last decade by recognized sociologists and anthropologists representing different methodological approaches. It is, for instance, Ghassan H., an Australian anthropologist born, born in Beirut, when describing a similar attitude towards everyone who does not belong to your ethnic community, writes about, quote unquote, the ethos of a besieged white colonial settler society. This attitude has become globalized today as one constructed along, uh, around the well-known global figure of otherness, the Muslim. In his other politics, published in 2015, Hage proposes to take a closer look at Western societies, which after economic, refugee, and ecological crisis made a transition from being initially open and welcoming to other cultures toward the state of a permanent deadlock and closure. He explains it as follows, and I quote, as the welfare state shrinks we increasingly have a state interested in governing the effects of social crisis rather than in the search for its causes." Unquote. In effect, such anti-politics does nothing but heightens basic conflicts in all, all areas of life and escalates the feeling of having no future. Therefore, what we need just now, Hage insists, are speculative visions of a possible future, similar to those designed by feminists back in the uh, 1980s. However, to practice the eponymous alter politics, it is not enough to speculate about possible future in the field of economy or ecology. We need also alternative ways of thinking and experiencing otherness. Obviously, not only Hage has pointed out a close connection between the welfare state's anti-politics and the importance of speculating about a better future in a world 
that is about a paradigmatic change. In his um, design for the Pluripels, and Arturo Escobar, a Colombian American anthropologist, convincingly depicts the recent global eco eco crisis as, unquote, the crisis of a particular world or set of world making practices, the dominant form of Euro modernity, unquote. As a result, he identifies an urgent need for, and I quote once again, a transition from the hegemony of modernity's one word ontology to a pluriverse of social natural configurations, reimagining and reconstructing local worlds. With this in mind, I would like to posit that an important way to enact non dualist relational worlds as multiple onto-epistemic formations, while highlighting the internal and external interconnectedness, it is to redefine the concept of contact zones. Introduced by literary tourist and linguist Marie Louise Pratt in the early 1990s. Also, Pratt did her best to offer a new perspective on encounters or even confrontation between two or more cultures, she did it. She did not move beyond the already existing center periphery models, which, for instance, both Arjuna Pudarai and Stephen Greenblatt later deemed quite inapplicable in the era of global migration. For the models take for granted the stability, fixity, and coherence of cultures before they are disrupted or contaminated when meeting or clashing with one another. Therefore, if the concept of contact zone should remain operational in our world of global migration and permanent crisis and bring forth much needed new forms of communication and communities, we have to look back at the moment of a formulation in order to redefine it and make applicable, make applicable in the present context. Uh, Marie Louise Pratt coined the term contact zones in her keynote address at Modern Language Association Literary Literacy Conference in 1990. She did it with the clear expressed intention, and I quote, to contrast ideas of community that underlie much of the thinking about language, communication, and culture that gets done in the academia. Unquote. As her main example, Pratt took a comprehensive letter which an indigenous Andean Poma de Ayala wrote to King Philip the, the, the Third of Spain in the city of Cusco, Peru, in the early 1610s. As she argued, the letter, found by chance in the Danish royal archive in Copenhagen three centuries later, opened a space of encounters typical of colonial systems, which she termed a contact zone. The notion was, and I quote, to refer to social spaces where cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other, often in context of highly asymmetrical relation of power, unquote. With reference to this example, Pratt proposed her own model of an autoethnographic text which critically engages with representations which the others made, have made of us. Also, such texts could be socially and culturally complex, only seemingly do they have an inter interactional dimension. However, Pratt did not limit contact zone to textual materials. The notion covers all kinds of phenomena pertaining to, tra to transculturation in other disciplines and media and applies to the ways and strategies of appropriating and adapting fragments of the representational repertoire of a dominant culture of the invader or the metropolis. Ever since its definition in 1990, the concept of contact zones had been reformulated and modified by many researchers from various fields 
who foregrounded different aspects of the original concept, and I mentioned already Arjuna Pudarani and Stephen Greenblatt. But most recently, it was Donna Haraway, an American biologist uh, and um, a, a feminist philosopher, who in her when species meet from 2008, highlighted one specific contact zone which she named nature culture. However, she did not limit her definition to, to cross-species communication, quite the opposite. It could refer also to all intra and interrelations between nation, ethnic groups, or other kind of communities. For Haraway defines embodied communication as a flow of entangled meaningful bodies in time, and I quote, a shared trans species being in the world constituted by complex relation of trust, respect, dependence and communication, unquote. Clearly, this formulation, based upon one chosen example of cross-species relationship, in this case between her and um, her dog, she-dog, subverts the inherently binary opposition between the practice of cultural asymmetry specific to Western countries and uh, with utopia of harmonious multiculturalism that have been characteristic for the previous definition and redefinition of Pratt's contact zone. Nonetheless, it does not address adequately the question of how to design such, and I quote once again, complex relation of trust, respect, dependence and communication for human communities in the context of recent and upcoming crises which may turn out to be even more severe. It is not an easy task because, as I already pointed out, the crux of today's crisis, the effects of which the welfare state only tries to govern, constitute an increasingly evident failure of so fiercely promoted multiculturalism. Significantly, multiculturalism is in its Western guise in the 1980s and 1890s was based on a highly asymmetrical relation between the encompassing and encompassed <coughs> cultures. The dominant culture offered within its scope only a limited space of tolerance. However, in the case of deeply religious Muslims, all aspects of everyday life are governed by the laws of their God. And this is a kind of religiosity that constitute a serious negation of the logic of multicultural acceptability. Thus, within the framework of Alta politics, Hage wonders whether and how the fake <coughs> multiculturalism could be replaced by alternative realities that could coexist and mutually respect one another, not only to respect of tolerance, towards another, but really mutually respect one another. That such a recognition of cultural diversity does necessarily mean an acceptance of epistemic plurality is also demonstrated by a Portuguese sociologist Bonaventura de Sousa Santos. In his Epistemologies of the South, Justice Against Epistemicity from 2014, he posits a speculative concept of ecology of knowledges, which encompasses diverse and interviewing epistemic practices. What is important, for him every social practice is at the same time an epistemic practice. Thus, he puts the economic and ecological crisis on a par with the epistemic one, and looks for alternatives which could hardly be envisaged within any of Eurocentric critical theories. While highly critical towards the Western epistemy, the Sousa Santos is deeply convinced that we ought to appreciate all the social practices, ways of life and experiences which have been marginalized by the monoculture of the models in Europe. 
Therefore, he writes, and I quote, what is usually called Western modernity is a very complex set of phenomena in which dominant and subaltern perspective coexist and constitute rival modernities, unquote. The Sousa Santos is certain that if we leave aside the issue of our past, which ought to be imagined anew, it will be impossible to design new ways of how Western societies could transform and emancipate themselves. Moreover, a newly imagined past has to encompass all those realities, or even worlds, which have been suppressed, silenced, or marginalized. In his epistemologies of the South, the Sousa Santos postulate, therefore, a new sociological transgressive procedure, which he calls the sociology of absences. And I quote, this consists, he writes, of an inquiry that aims to explain that what does not exist, and in fact actively produced as non-existent, that is, a non-credible alternative to what exists. Unquote. For this reason, he speaks also about epistemicity, caused merely by the hegemonic and Eurocentric modernity. As such, the destruction of knowledge involves the destruction of social practices and the disqualification of the social agents that operate accordingly, uh, that operate accordingly. It cannot remain without consequence. One of them, the Sousa Santo argues, it's a still deepening abyss between the global north and the global south, a process premised on the invisibility of popular, lay, plebeian, peasant, or indigenous knowledges, which do not fit into any of the hegemonic ways of knowing and, for this reason, vanish as relevant to the a supposedly universal knowledge or commensurable with dominant social and life practices. Bearing this in mind, it seems quite obvious that we have to work out basic rules of coexistence of heterogeneous situated knowledges and realities premised upon them. Basic rules of how to consult diverse cognitive maps which use alternative scales and perspectives. It is in this context that the Sousa Sanctus recalls Pratt's definition of context zones. However, he does it only to postulate a new type of them, namely translational context zone. This new zone has to involve linguistic and interlinguistic phenomena and be politically articulated. Was significant, the Sousa Sanctus understands translatability as the unacknowledge of difference and the motivation to deal with it that makes hegemony impossible. He explains it as follows, and I quote, ecologies of knowledges and intercultural translation can only proceed and flourish in subaltern cosmopolitan contact zones, that is, decolonial contact zones." Unquote. Although I perfectly appreciate his motivation, I am not totally convinced that the sole introduction of the new type of contact zones will do without, any, without an already postulated much deeper modification of plant definition. For I am positive that only then the basic question which epistemologists of the South formulates in the context of knowledge premised upon order could be properly addressed, namely, quote unquote, whether it is possible to know by creating solidarity. Uh, in the same vein, James Clifford formulated similar questions. And I quote a rather long quotation, mm -hmm. stories of cultural contact and change have been structured by a pervasive dichotomy, absorption, absorption by the other or resistance to the other. Yet, what, is, what if identity is conceived not as a boundary to be maintained, but as a nexus of relations and transactions 
actively engaging a subject. The story or stories of interaction might, must then be more complex, less linear and theological. What changes when the subject of history is no longer Western? How do stories of contact, resistance and assimilation appear from the standpoint of groups in which exchange rather than identity is the fundamental value to be sustained? And here is the important exchange rather than identity. I have quoted Clifford's citation almost in its entirety because what is this about is really important nowadays. In a sense, the issue of whether it is possible both to know by creating solidarity and value exchange more than identity is commented upon in Alta Politics by Hedge. By defining the, his concept of the so-called multiple realities, he refers to the alter anthropology of a Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Viveiros de Castro and his understanding of the relational identity which has been informed by Amer, Amer Indian perspectives. As a result, Viveiros de Castro posits a unified subjectivity producing a multiplicity of natures or realities. What is significant here is the assumption that quote, the different points of view on this here. Uh, okay. yeah. What is uh, significant here is the assumption that the different points of view emerge from the ways in which different bodies constitute different modes of relating to, inhabiting and being enmeshed environments, unquote. In other words, none of the different points of view means any subjective interest. For here, a perspective is not a representation. The point of view is always in the body, grounded in its cumulative experiences and effects. Contrary to Viveiros de Castro's anthropological approach, Hage seeks comparative examples in the Western folk as, for instance, Pierre Bourdieu's concept of bodily habitus, which, at least partially, share a similar vision of multiple realities as the Castro and Hage himself. Despite the fact that Bourdieu's different worlds produce within the framework of the modern concept of reality, by no means make room for the possibility of radical alterity, as posited in Viveiros de Castro's work, the French philosopher thought differences between such durable, transposable dispositions as worldviews or rules of conduct and thinking because they usually operate beneath the level of rational ideology and as such are the best proof of subject living in alternative realities. Tough Bourdieu conceptualized the very core of what alterity of the altar could mean, its bodily and affective grounding in the reality each one lives in. Uh, it is with clear irony that H repeats in his altar politics that one of the greatest accomplishment of the Western modernity has been to convince the moderns that there exists a single reality. However, and I quote, our reality is far more layered and differentiated than the fog and dead, just that they are dominant and dominated forces within a reality, they are also dominant and dominated realities. Therefore, it is quite evident that speculative contact zones should not limit themselves to language, communication and culture as Pratt once defined them. They have to take into account epistemic differences which result from ontological characteristic of multiple worlds that exist side by side in one and the same pluriverse as depicted by the Sansa Santos and Arturo Escobar. 
A notion that seems quite handy in redefining the contact zones is undoubtedly a material semiotic category of committed knowledge as a form of care, presumed upon in the interdependency as the ontological state. As Ma Maria Puig de la Bella Casa explains in her Matters of Care and Speculative Ethics in More Than Human Worlds from 2017, caring implicates different rationalities, issues and practices in different settings. And it means, first of all, taking responsibility for the other's well-being. In her book, Western speculative ethics meets what Amer, Amer Indians call, called and still call buen vivir, good living, or sumak kafsai in Quechua, the native language of Poma de Ayala, who wrote a letter to the Spanish king over 400 years ago. No wonder, therefore, that Puig de la Balacasa sees in the eponymous matters of care a response to the agonistic politics of incompatible interest and power relation. Thus, she writes, and I quote, respect of concerns and the call for care becomes arguments to moderate a critical standpoint, the kind of standpoint that tends to produce divergences and oppositional knowledges based on attachment to particular visions, and indeed, that sometimes presents its positions as non-negotiable, unquote. What is an importance in my context, she never speaks about caring in terms of epistemic normativity and ethical obligation. For her, it is always a transformative ethos which involves affective, ethical, and hands-on agencies of practical and material consequence. That is why caring is not only, I quote, a speculative affective mode that encourages intervention in what things could be. It is also haptic speculation which, and I quote again, it is not about the imaginative expectation of events to come. It is the everyday survival strategy rooted rooted in the present of life before the radar of optic orders that do not welcome, know, or e not even perceive the practices that exceed pre-existent representations and meanings." Unquote. So a better future is not so much for a scene, but rather for a touch in this case. Haptic speculation, defined by Puig de Abalacasa, is of utmost importance when one thinks about designing both new kinds of contact zones and new communities. First of all, we should conceive it as the everyday survival strategy in the time of global crisis and life on the damaged planet. The strategy was practiced in the real life and in the arts. I have no time to discuss the, de the details of the two novels I have chosen, uh, therefore it will be a kind of invitation for you to read or reread the books, whose authors wrote only, not only what Donna Haraway calls speculative fabulation, but also speculated about haptic speculation as a way of building and maintaining, of caring for new communities and they are here in the books. Um, I think here about the unfinished Aristide trilogy written by Octavia E. Butler in the 1990s and about the climate fiction novel New York 2140 by Kim Steiner Robinson published in 2017. Both narrative takes place in the near future. The former is set in the late 2020s and 2030s in California, scourged by droughts, earthquakes and fires, with all its inhabitants on the move for a better chance of life to the north, to Canada and, and uh, uh, under 
The action of the later takes place in the eponymous 2140 in the lower Manhattan, flooded by two major rises in seawater levels, but still a preferable destination of refugees fleeing from disasters in other parts of the world. So, in a sense, the end of 90s and the early beginning of 20s is repeated here with the sun the same different people coming together and wanting to survive. Um, what is important is unprecedented catastrophe served both authors Butler and Robinson as an experimental zone, a veritable hotbed of new hands-on design for societal transition meant as a reinvention of the human and the communal, as well as particular ways of being, knowing and doing, of being together, trusting to and caring for each other. If today the main aim of design, once central political technology of modernity, is to cause creative ontological friction, the two novels, I suppose, do it in an exemplary fashion.